Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast, episode 5, in which we'll be dealing with three chapters, chapters 5 to 7 in the book, uh, In the Woods, the story of the blessing of Elacherera, and The Lendry and the River. Uh, I've decided to go for three episodes and explain a bit in a bit why that is. So first of all, a bit of housekeeping. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'm learning is that I mustn't assume that I've made mistakes. Um, I did a, make an assumption that I've made a certain mistake, mistaking uh, something that happened in the film version, 1978 film version, for what happened in the book. So when I clarified last time about Blackberry and Dandelion having the first conversation in the book, when I checked back on the episode two, I didn't actually say that. I didn't actually make that mistake. So... Um, I really must check I've made mistakes before making the mistake of clarifying a mistake that I haven't made, if you understand my meaning. So, yeah, I was uh, I was better at that than I thought I was. So, sorry about that. Um, I also have realised I've got to start saying geek less. I'm saying geek an awful lot, so I will try to avoid saying geek. So that'll be the last time I say it this episode. Um, I've got my first shout-outs for those who've been commenting on the podcast, which is great. Um, these are to Natty Plavin, and I hope I haven't... Uh, pronounced your name incorrectly there she's from israel and will fuller who doesn't give his location as is his right they're both from the watership down fans facebook group and thank you for your lovely comments and they're much appreciated um that group was actually one of the inspirations for beginning this podcast so it, it's great to have any such feedback um i've also had a comment from nathan hollick from um florida that the podcast is a bit quiet um I'm sorry about that. I can understand that. Um, I've seen some of the equipment some people use for podcasts. I only record this on my smartphone, so I can believe that it is possibly a little bit low in volume. Um, I'm looking into affordable alternatives, um, as I've no plan for a Patreon or similar as yet. So, um, no, I will, I'll look into improving the sound quality, the recording quality, if I can. But thank you for your feedback. It all helps. Um, <clears throat> I also learned from Martin Riley's post on, on the Watership Fans group that the Working title for Watership Down, because I mentioned this previously, wanting to know what the working title might have been, was Hazel and Fiverr, apparently. Um, perfectly reasonable title, I suppose, but I'm, I'm glad they changed it overall. I thought I should mention that, yeah, in, in like, like I said in my speculation episode two, he's, um, he's also posted a fascinating image of some pre-publication notes that have been discovered in a book in Richard Adams' library, which was incredible to see. Some criticisms of the initial book, some of which... Well, most of which I don't actually agree with, but um, interesting to see that feedback from so early in the development of the book. Now, when it comes to the Facebook group Warship Down Fans, there seem to be two Facebook groups with the name Watership Down Fans, and they've both got almost the same cover picture. One doesn't capitalise the word fans, and it's a far smaller group. Um, also possibly more America-based, uh, uh, I've realised since I made these notes. Um, now, is, is that... A coincidence that there are two groups with this, almost the same name and with almost the same um, profile picture? Um, or is it a face of a, a case of a, um, some kind of Facebook schism? Um, I'm not going to look into that. I don't really care. In any case, I'll be following and posting on both. I'm not taking sides on that. Uh, both groups are equally valid and I'll be posting on both. Right, I've made some editorial decisions. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to be dealing with the versions of Warship Down in chronological order rather than all the books, for the both books first. So that means that when I finish going through the um, book, I will move on to the 1978 film and then go on to the sequel book, Tales from Warship Down 1996, and then the 1999-2001 TV series. So I'll be going through them chronologically. Um, I've also decided my site visits... Um, we'll follow the numerical order on the map at the start of the book. Um, these will be filmed for YouTube as well, and will be occasional episodes whenever I can get to the area, because it's a, it's a two-hour drive from where I live in Sussex. Um, right now, we're just coming out of, of lockdown of this stay-at-home order, this being March of 2021, so it's feasible for me to actually go there. Previously, I haven't been able to, but... Um, as it's just been lifted, um, it's feasible for me to make the first of those visits. So watch this space. Um, I don't have any immediate plans for when I'll get out to that area, but uh, we'll see. I've also started listening to the audiobook of Tales from Watership Down, which I read once about 20 years ago when it first um, came out. Um, and I'm finding it a very comforting return to the world of the Down. I'm really enjoying it. And it's a great read. So today I'll be dealing with three chapters. Two of them are short, 
and one is a long one, sandwich, sandwiched between the other two, and that longer chapter uh, may just be familiar to you. So, on to chapter five, In the Woods. Okay, the opening quote is from R.M. Lockley's The Private Life of the Rabbit, which is a book uh, Adams references a lot, and it's a quote about rabbits leaving a warren to find somewhere else to settle, which is quite appropriate. Um, now, apparently it's getting on for moonset when they leave the fields and enter the woods. Um, possibly indicates how slowly they're travelling. I mean, that's quite a few hours for the moon to set. And yet and, and Hazel is still nervous of the owls are finding them, even though they're further from the warren than any of them have ever been, he's guessing. So, a little bit of contradiction, perhaps. Well, why, why is there so little apparent urgency if they've been travelling that slowly? Uh, they're following a brook down the field and, and the brook leads into the woods and he decides to go straight in, Hazel decides to go straight into the woods even though it's an unnatural environment for rabbits. And this is rather than risk them wandering around the fields possibly ending up back at the warren. And we're told his internal monologue here, his, his actual words and once again I think he's the only character in the book that, that where we, we hear his actual internal monologue. He doesn't consult with Bigwig at all, he just goes straight in, he makes that decision. And the spookiness of the woods at night for rabbits is very well described in terms of smells and unfamiliar sounds. It's a very unnatural environment for them. Their, their, their reactions to the unfamiliar is to startle and then to bolt, normally for a hole, or a rabbit hole. Well, there are no rabbit holes here. So the continual startling and nearly bolting reactions become exhausting for them. And in the woods, and this is very well described, that they, they lose the course of the brook. And eventually they're, they're just wandering through the woods between pools of moonlight. Um, Hazel scouts ahead down a path leading downhill, uh, deciding he needs to make sure what's ahead. Dandelion joins in very quickly and compliments him by comparing him to El Hrera, whose role in rabbit mythology is explained. More on this later. And we'll explain the origin of the phrase El Hrera as well. Uh, there's a first hint here of some crossover between human myth and rabbit myth, um, which uh, Richard Adams mentions Br'er Rabbit here, but I have to ask myself, how on earth would that possibly work? How on earth would human and rabbit myth possibly cross over at all? I, I don't understand how the, what that mechanism would be. Perhaps as we're dealing with a book where rabbits talk, it might be best to suspend disbelief. Um, as El Herrera is described, there's also a call forward to swimming a river, um, as one of the first mentions is made of one of the stories of El Herrera, and there's a story involving him evading a pike by trickery, but we'll come on to swimming rivers later. Now Bigwig now says they need to rest, they're exhausting, they've been plodding on at a rabbit's slower pace of moving for a long time now, and it's not natural for rabbits to keep moving at this slow pace for that long. And the rabbits have strag straggled widely. Um, Pipkin also seems to have something wrong with his paw. That they need to rest. And the reason for this is if they, if they need to be able to run, they need to be rested. If they need to be able to run away from, an, uh, from any dangerous cre creatures, they need to have rest. But just sitting in the woods won't help their mental state at all. So Hazel realises what they need to do is rest, but not brood. So his solution is to ask Dandelion if he could tell them a story. And Dandelion seems to realise that that is the purpose of what he's being asked to do. So he begins. Chapter 6. The story of the blessing of El Herrera. Now, this chapter will be very familiar to anyone who's seen the original film version as it opens the film, but doesn't open the book. And anyone who's new to the book might be surprised by that. Uh, it, it, it appears some way into the book. Um, a stylized version of this story was included at the start of the 1978 film. I know I said I wouldn't go on about the film versions, but in the case of this chapter, it is very relevant. Um, and as a result of that, it seems to become a convention that if you do a film version of Watership Down, you have to open with a stylized version of this chapter. The Netflix, Netflix version also uses it, a, a stylized version of, of this story. Um, and it's also t told in the first episode of the 1999 TV series. So it's not, it doesn't begin the epi episode, but 
again, a stylized representation of the story is shown. So ever since the first film version of, the, of, this, of this book, um, there's been a convention that this is the chapter that should open the story, but it actually doesn't. It actually is just the first story told, and it's told in the woods to try and keep the rabbit's spirits up, um, as described in the previous chapter. Now, the, the, the story gives us a first view of how rabbits see their place in the world. Um, it's quite Judeo-Christian in tone, I'm going to say. Um, you know, uh, again, I'm prepared to be controversial about that, but you know, it, it seems to me to reflect some Judeo-Christian themes. They're not all of them, as I'll make clear. Um, it starts with how Frith, who is basically God, made the world. Again, that's how creation stories start generally. Um, Frith is also, by the way, is very clearly the sun. You know, the sun is is God. You know, basically the sun of the sun as being Frith. Um, now there are dream type like elements, like in Ab Aboriginal stories from Australia. There are dream time like elements to this story. For example, the way Rilo, rivers follow Frith across the sky by day and and follow him at, at night, trying to find him. Um, but it does start out as an idealised world, as a kind of Garden of Eden. The world Frith creates first from his droppings, which he scatters across the sky and on the ground, which create living things. Um, the world starts out as a kind of idealised Garden of Eden, although it's the whole world, not one specific place. And in this, in this idealised world for rabbits, no animal eats another animal. They all like gra eat grass together. Now in this world lives El Achrera. Now, his name is a bit of a misnomer at this point because he's not yet what his name describes. El Khrera, which seems quite an Arabic name, is made up of Elil Khrera. In other words, the Elil, the enemies of rabbits, Khrera, many, a thousand, and Ra, king, chief, prince. So he is the enemies with a thousand prince, or king, the prince with a thousand enemies. Although at this point, he isn't that, so it's a bit, a bit strange that. That doesn't yet describe him, but that, that is the meaning of El Achrera, Elil Achrera. Now, El Achrera at this point is an animal who is, has many wives, as they're described. Um, he is uh, breeding and eating his way through the world. He angers Frith with this because it, this is his original sin. This is this Judeo-Christian theme of breeding too much. His people are breeding and eating their way through the world. Um, in the film we briefly see the other animals having a problem with this, but that's not actually described in the book. And Frith sees how much they are breeding and is angered by it. And yet to Elachrara this is a way of showing their appreciation of Frith. They're breeding their way, they're breeding their way through, way through the world and eating everything is a way of praising or, or Frith, of showing their appreciation of him. In this way, El Herrera at this point, although he's a bit of a messiah figure in the book, although he's a trickster messiah, he, he's more Adam and Eve than messiah at this point. He's committing that original sin, that mistake that he will come to regret. But El Frith decides not to destroy him because he needs his tricks in the world. Even though El Herrera has defied Frith and said, no, I, I, will not, I will not stop reading, I will not stop eating my way through the world. Um, this is my way of worshipping you. Um, Frith decides not to destroy him. Instead, he calls a meeting of all animals and decides to give each animal a gift. Now this, in that Judeo-Christian model, is the fall. This is the being cast out of the Garden of Eden. In the Judeo-Christian story, Adam and Eve have to leave the Garden of Eden. Instead, in this one, the world is turned into a more dangerous place for rabbits. Because some of the gifts that are given to animals turn them into the Elil. They make them into the animals that wish to kill uh, rabbits and wish to hunt them and kill them. But the crucial difference here is that um, in the story of Adam and Eve, there is, there is a loss of innocence. There is this kind of awareness of sin and so on. Well, not for rabbits. No, the rabbits stay proud, proud of what they are. They're not meant to be ashamed of what they were, eating and breeding their way through the world. They're still proud of it. El Herrera is on his way to this meeting, where he's going to get his gift, when he's warned via Swift as he's resting on a bank 
of what has happened that that Frith has granted some animals the wish to kill Elahera and his children and his children's children that that the weasel and the stoat that the cat the fox have been given these these gifts sharp teeth and the ability to kill and the wish to kill rabbits and this frightens him terrifies him so he starts to dig a hole he's ter terrified he tries to get get out of the way and hide from Frith so that when Frith arrives he can only see Elahera's bottom sticking out of the hole. Now Frith knows it's Elachrara, it's very clear from the story Frith knows this, but Elachrara thinks that Frith, Frith doesn't know this. The story breaks off at this point and in, in, to describe how familiar it is to the rabbits who are listening um, and how well it's working to calm them down in the woods. Remember they're in a terrifying situation as it's being told. Because all rabbits see themselves as, as having the right to be impudent towards Frith, to be cheeky, to be a trickster. It's an interesting take on how a prey animal might see the world. But here, like I say, we, do, we divert from the Judeo-Christian pattern completely. Um, for Adam and Eve, the fall is purely negative. They're cast out of the Garden of Eden. They're, they're, they're punished. They have to wear clothes. They become ashamed of their nudity. Um, whereas in this story, the rabbits retain that pride. They retain that view of themselves. Um, Elachrara is unwilling to come out of the hole because he thinks he's hiding from Frith. Um, but that defines the gift he's given because Ella, uh, Frith decides to bless his bottom. And you can't help thinking this is deliberate on the part of Frith. By blessing his bottom, he's given strong hind legs for running and stamping on the ground to warn other rabbits. And the, of course, the flashing white tail you see when rabbits run away. And as soon as he gets that gift, he leaves the hole instantly and runs away because he's now the fastest creature on earth. And that is the gift of Elachrara and all rabbits. And the chapter ends with a very familiar speech from Frith that you will have heard at the start of the opening part of the film's versions, which makes the place of rabbits and the world very clear. Unlike humans, Frith has decided that rabbits are not going to rule the world however much they may want to. Now in the Judeo-Christian model, even though people are fallen and we're sinners, we still we have dominion over other animals. Well, that's not the case with rabbits. As prey, they will be killed when they are caught. But they're ideally made not to get caught in the first place. So although Frith will not be mocked by them, he's promised them they can never be destroyed. That's, that's a very different model. That's a very different worldview of yourself in the world in relation to, to God, to divinity in the world and hazards in the world. And the chapter closes very touchingly with a, with a reference to rabbits feeding at sunset. Now sunset is when Frith's work is done, when he's sinking out of the sky because Frith is the sun. And rabbits feed at that time at sunset because this is when they feel safe in his sight. So on to chapter 7, The Lendry and the River. Now the quote at the beginning of this chapter is in French, and I've never bothered translating it before, I've always wondered what it said, and it's actually quite relevant. It's by Napoleon Bonaparte, and I found the translation. And the translation is, I won't try and read it out in the French, my French is awful, but the translation is, quote, As for moral courage, it is very rare, he said, to find that kind found at two o'clock in the morning, that is to say, courage in the face of the unexpected. Napoleon Bonaparte, obviously a brilliant tactician, and um, in effect that's been used as a compliment towards certainly Hazel, and um, also Bigwig, I think, um, because they certainly are rabbits who can improvise in these kind of situations they're going to come across. And they need to immediately, because as the story ends, this wonderful story of Ella Ferreira and the creation of the world, um, they become aware of a badger or lendry nearby as it comes across them, it breaks into the clearing where they are, and um, although badgers don't seem to be the worst of the allil of the thousand, the, the rabbits aren't going to take any chances. Bigwig takes the lead here, which is his role. Um, this is exactly why they needed to rest, because they needed to be able to get away from any danger. Um, and a short while after that, along a path parallel to the one they followed when they heard, uh, to the clearing where they heard the story, they find themselves suddenly on the banks of the River Enborn. Of course, they don't call it that. 
The big wig is irritated by this obstacle, and we learn by this what Hazel thinking about that element of Bigwig's character that Bigwig is best when he can see a clear plan of action. You know, when he could see what needs to be done when he attacks Holly, for example, that he knows they need to go straight away. The river has prevented that. The river is a blockage for that, and this is where Bigwig could become a hindrance. So Hazel is very clever. He distracts Bigwig with a compliment about his leadership away from the Lendry. Because interesting, he's thinking what the Freya Ra, the chief rabbit of the Sandalfoot Warren in the book, which they've just left, would do in this situation. And of course, complimenting someone, taking the aggression out of the situation, taking the tension out of the situation is, is, the, is the sensible thing to do. So he, he, Hazel's showing his leadership qualities here again, how to handle people, well, not people, rabbits, but you know what I mean. So Bigwood describes, have been asked about this, how badgers will kill young or injured rabbits, but they can easily be run away from, and the rabbits can even live very near them. So they're not the worst of the allele, but all the same, best to be avoided. Blackberry, observant as ever, points out that the Lendry had just killed and had blood on its lips, which is possibly why it wasn't of such a danger to them. Um, but now all the rabbits have joined them. And uh, Fiverr looks at the river and says, even though he's exhausted, that they need to cross it. Now Bigwood find that's finds that ridiculous. Why do we need to cross it? It's ridiculous. Um... In any case, although rabbits can swim, they don't prefer to, but they can swim, Fiverr and Pickigan are too exhausted to at this point. Speedwell says he doesn't want to jump into the river, unsurprisingly. And um, Hawkbit, who's not the brightest of rabbits, just says, well, why don't we just go along the bank? Well, Hazel thinks that if Fiverr says they should cross the river, then it might be dangerous not to. He trusts Fiverr's instincts. And then realises, and it's wonderfully described, that it's the morning. And that on the other side of the river are open fields. So, in effect, they've come through the woods. And if they cross the river, they won't be in the woods anymore. Well, that ends that episode. I won't be often be doing three chapters in one episode, but it did seem justified in that case. Um, longer chapters will get their own episode. Um... So join me next time for chapter eight, The Crossing. And the title of that chapter should give you some kind of clue as to what is going to happen next. <laughs>